talking about our uh, just talking about our swimming experiences in past life. I fucked the water, bro. <laughs> also, when did you fucking get ten years younger? Me when I got this fucking banging haircut. <laughs> <laughs> fresh face. Uh, I'm, also, I'm also not running a gram anymore. <laughs> probably, probably, yeah. That's out. Um, um, yeah, we're just we're just talking about how how swimming in open water is um, probably the scariest thing you can do. I I, I personally believe it's the stupidest thing you can do. <laughs> if I, I I've always said if I was meant to be in the water, I'd have gills. Yeah, yeah, that was terrible. I remember. <laughs> when, uh, I, I was on a holiday once, and uh, I was with my girlfriend at the time. And I'd only just met her a couple of weeks beforehand and agreed to go on this holiday. Do you know those like um do you know those like pedlo things that you put on the, the I've, I've heard it, I've heard the story about the go on see, right? So obviously she's with some of her girlfriends, they've invited me, you know. I'm I'm from I'm from Dublin, I'm thinking I'm Johnny Big Balls, you know. Bear in mind, I can't swim, I've never been able <laughs> I've never been able to swim and I have an absolute terrifying fear of the water. So obviously these things have like the slides on them, you know. <laughs> you know, so they're like, woohoo, girls, slide, you know, Ross, come into the water. I'm like, right. I either say I'm not, say no, I look like a bitch, right? Or I slide in, stay close to the boat, climb back on, and nobody notices I can't swim. So I'm like, right, I'll do the second option. <laughs> <laughs> so I can't slide, right? But as I'm going down, the chick in the front of us starts to pedal. <laughs> so by the time I turn around, right, they're gone. They're at least 50 meters ahead of me. And I'm trying to, like, you know, not give everyone an ick, but I'm drowning, bro. <laughs> I'm never proper drowning. You'd rather drown than give the ick, bro. Robert Jones, <laughs> I'm like trying to keep a straight face. I'm like, yo, I'm struggling here. I'm struggling here. And then suddenly this, <laughs> they had to jump in and save me. I was saved from drowning by a girl. <laughs> just, blame, just blame it on cramp to say, yeah, I'm getting cramped. Yeah. In there. I'm, so, <laughs> I'm just so lean and dehydrated. Yeah. Very good. Yeah, I've had some bad experiences. It's not the one. No, not at all. No. Not for me. I'll get into a out of control feeling. So. <laughs> so I remember we were in Mykonos and they, they were like, go to the deep end. And me and you were like, nah, 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 we're good. We'll stay honestly, right honestly I, I think I'll be all right in the shallow end. Um, yeah. I'm all right here. Yeah. If he can touch the ground, I'm good. But who, was it, who was it that slipped by the pool in Mykonos? Was it Zoe or um, Hannah? It was Zoe. Uh, it might have been someone, Zoe, was, yeah. someone, was, someone was running, right? And she, yeah, it might, it might have been. Clear, clear on camera. There's a, few, there's a few tumbles that we get. I think it was uh, yeah. <laughs> I remember a 2021 cow after the prep we did together. You know, talking about going natural swimming. Yeah. Hey, I, this was probably about two weeks post prep. And obviously, natural swimming, the water's cold, right? So I went with my auntie because she goes all the time. And I was like, yeah, I'll, I'll do it with you after prep. Jumped in. I was like, it's not too bad. Started swimming. And then all of a sudden, my body just completely seized up. I was like, shit. I had to try and swim back. And at this point, my whole body was just like shutting down. It was just like, oh, as in like you, can't not... touch, you can't touch the bottom at this point. No, it's, it's really deep. It's oh, really deep. Oh. And I'm like, fuck, I've got a life jacket on nothing. Right. I managed to climb out. And then for the next half an hour, cannot remember a thing. My whole, I, was, I went, I went, I went hypothermic. Yeah. I was like completely fucked. Was that? that was Stony Cove. Don't know if you know it. Stony, I'm plenty of cold myself. Yeah, man. <laughs> <laughs> Actually, I went and I took a, I took a dip in the canal this morning. You didn't. I swear to God, yeah. But like, the, the but like, the, I don't even think it is a canal. It's like the docks. The docks are freshwater docks. People keep telling me that. That ain't um, freshwater, mate. That is not freshwater. <laughs> <laughs> I look, I look 10 years younger. You, you, in, you, need, you need to go and get checked ASAP. <laughs> no, they have like freaking, they have like um, water sports in it. All. There's always those weird kids swimming in it. I just took a dip for like 20 oh, seconds. Yeah, that, that's funny. Yeah. yeah. I feel like if they're in it and they're doing, you know, swimming and whatever they're doing, I feel like I can yeah, dip it for 20 seconds. Yeah, I can dip it for 20 seconds and get back in. Fucking hell. Did you see those athletes think... after the um, triathlon? That's... Yeah, yeah loads of clothes, weren't they? Yeah. So, yeah. Yeah. At the Olympics, after the uh, triathlon swim in the Sen, oh, yeah. those, of them, those of them got hospitalised because the water was so dirty. Oh. There's so much crazy shit about that Olympics, man. It's fucked. So much, so much crazy shit about it. A lot of controversy. But there, are, there always is, but this one is particularly crazy. You know, the kind of way it's just nuts. The whole thing is mental. There we go. Yeah. 
Well, it kind of, it kind of, um, kind of felt at the first hurdle when they did like that Last Supper with like a load of fucking. What is that? Like, I don't, I don't, understand. I don't understand. <laughs> I don't think we have any. I don't think we have any transgender viewers. Can why, uh, why? Why would you? Why, why would you go there? Just like, just keep it fucking on the straight and narrow. And just... Apparently, it's actually the story of Dionysus, which is a Greek goddess, but it looks very like the Last Supper, like, and then. There's also that. There's also that fucking that, that Dutch dude who raped the thirteen year old. I saw that. Yeah. Italy. Yeah. That's fucking nuts. Like that. All that is nuts. All that's mental. We need to bring the enhanced games quickly. Let all those gearheads go and fight each other, and that'll take over the Olympics. Yeah. That thing's gonna be class. Have you heard about that? That enhanced games thing. Yeah. I saw uh, the, yeah, the, yeah. the the two blokes who's uh, founded that was on the Joe Rogan podcast um, a couple yeah. of months ago, and I, I watched that. It's cool, man. I think it's a cool idea. Yeah, I did put my application. <laughs> I imagine it was the same as the Olympics. They just brought everyone to the point where, like, ah, they're all okay. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, there's actually no difference. Same uh, well, I, I want to see like 120 kilo guys run like an 8.5, 100 meter. That's, that's what I want to see. That's the fucking NFL. Yeah, man, it's gonna be sick. That would be a that would be a spectacle. Brian, relax. Is, is Ian paid you to wear that shirt or? <laughs> no, I feel like I need to wear it a little bit more at the registration, right? So obviously it was my show, so I wanted to look trippy. <laughs> so I got a pretty decent outfit for her. And he comes up to me halfway to the registration and goes, put that on. I was I looked at him dead in the eye. I was like, you know, I didn't pay enough for this outfit, but to change my t-shirt for you. No. <laughs> <laughs> he respected it. <laughs> uh right. We have got quite a few questions on the old stories. I always like when that happens. This is a question for Lewis. We're going to get started. You ready, Lou? Let's go. Um, Adding adding tricep volume in over time may slow chest growth to an extent if slows down pressing progression. So, So you're saying that tricep fatigue with the accumulated volume is going to potentially affect chest growth exactly that yeah i mean it's just a case of like managing it like literally just log booking assessing whether things are moving whether they're not and then literally just adjusting the volume from there like it's not you can accumulate that's that's basically how you accumulate volume is you accumulate it to a point where you're still progressing but obviously therefore you're still you're working with more workload because you're doing more volume as well if you're going to add volume and you're kind of but overall performance is going to drop off, then that volume is pretty much rendered useless. So it has to be, you know, progressive overall, as long as you're still adding more kind of volume as you go, if that makes sense. Yeah. So I always find these questions not like annoying, but like there's also the aspect of it where there's very, very few people who are genuinely now are in that situation who are going to be at a loss because their triceps are getting bigger and their chest is maybe not getting as much. Like you probably need more muscle there anyway. So you probably haven't lost out. You know, you might just need, you might just have gotten to a point now where the specificity of the way that you think about your programming needs to be adapted, you know, rather than that your training is some kind of like immediate failure because you've seen some shift in volume that wasn't expected. You know, it's probably the side of a good thing and having to shift your parameters and training for that kind of reason is probably a positive more than a negative yeah agreed um ross his a thyroid yes. question <laughs> i don't know you love about everything about the thyroid maca morris maca maurice us any scenario where you wouldn't remove, sorry, any scenario where you wouldn't use T3 or T4 or remove in off season or prep, any scenario where you wouldn't use T3 or T4 or remove in off season or prep. Any, okay. So is he asking me, is there a situation where I would be inclined to not use T3 or T4? And then is there a situation where I would remove it in an off season? Yeah, so I, yeah. I, basically, yeah. Like, when what what are the signs and symptoms, or what are you waiting for before you add it? And also, would you then see merit in running it year round, for example, in the off season, or would you be pulling it out? Yeah, 
Okay, that's fair enough. That, that, that's a little bit more clear. So my apologies, Maka. Um, I'm foreign, so forgive me. Um, so, but, uh, right, so situations where I wouldn't use it, it might seem really, really simple, but where condition standards are improving and I haven't put it in yet, that might seem like a really, really simple answer. Um, but in many, many cases in the past, I've I've used T4 or T3 kind of based off this idea that I'm getting close enough to stage that I'm probably going to need it rather than kind of actually assessing the the rate of loss a little bit more. Um, so you, you've got like the kind of the moral compassy way of assessing somebody's need for thyroid hormone. And then you have kind of like the, I've done this a shitload of times. Therefore, this is probably going to be a valid thing to do. Um, so the moral compassy way is if you're starting to see like, you know, decalations in someone's capacity to drop body fat or drop body weight, or you're seeing almost like what seems like an anomaly in their body weight trends. And it kind of comes in that window where you're like, this guy is getting a little bit lean or particularly this girl is getting a little bit lean. Um, when you start to see these kind of anomalies and the like, like things just hold for a while, maybe you start to see those kind of immediate, like, you know, fatigue really, really picks up. And then you start to see people kind of shift in their, like their verbal biofeedback to you, kind of like how they're feeling. That's kind of when you might turn around to go, this might be an idea. And then you try and find pieces of evidence to suggest that that might be a thing. So again, is this person an experienced athlete? If they are, the likelihood of them needing some kind of thyroidal support in the earlier stages of prep or in prep at all is probably a little bit higher. Um, if they're a little bit less experienced or they're younger or they're coming off the back of a little bit more of a fresh off season on the basis of high food, the likelihood of them needing it is going to be a little bit lower. Um, for example, Liam Watson, um, anyone who's seen him this weekend, he was shredded out of his teeth. Uh, he didn't use a... a not a milligram of thyroid support he didn't need it one he's 21 you know like he, he probably doesn't have the same capacity to see those kind of hormonal declinations as a more experienced athlete does because the way you kind of need to look at it is that repeated bouts of prep kind of age your internal physiology a little bit like you kind of get to a point where you've been exposed to these environmental stresses that do to some degree have a lasting impact especially if then when you finish the show you jump straight back into training like an animal or you stress yourself out the high habit you're probably then going to be leaning into somebody who may need to then continue with the use of thyroid and support. Mm -hmm. um, I've done this in a presentation before where if you have somebody who's on enough thyroid support, enough being, you know, whatever spectrum of enough you deem, you know, in terms of like what's, what's a lot and what's a little or what's kind of replacement, which is usually 25 and 100. The kind of tapering process from that would be, you know, dropping from whatever kind of super physiological dose of T3 you're using pulling that belt down to replacement alongside replacement T4, sustaining that for a couple of weeks while that individual gets over the hump of post-show. And then from there, you can start to kind of reduce or just totally pull T3 and maintain that basis of T4. Because what we need to understand is that the thyroidal axis is heavily, heavily influenced by stress. And um, stress being this kind of like universal umbrella term for basically anything that makes you feel a little bit shit. Um, and in that immediate post-show window, that's kind of when you're going to be, you know, significantly exposed to that from a mental perspective. Obviously, during actual prep, you've been exposed to it from a physical perspective. The body is dysregulating its hormonal output naturally. Essentially, what the body is doing is it's like going, holy shit, like you're moving an awful lot. You're eating an awful lot less. I need to lower my metabolic rate or else you're going to start feeding into yourself. The nervous system doesn't necessarily have eyes. Now, obviously, your eyes are part of your nervous system. But what I mean by that is... It's like an analogous way of thinking about the fact that your body is simply reacting to outside stimulus. So when you start seeing somebody kind of get to a point where their thyroid hormones begin to drop, it's a protective mechanism. You know, it's your body regulating itself to be like, I need to conserve this individual's capacity to handle the food that they're eating. Obviously, though, when we're on a prep, that's not necessarily what we need. And that's where you may start to lean into something like the use of thyroidal support or super physiological thyroid in the upper ends of the athlete spectrum. Like I'm not... I'm not averse to using high thyroid if it's necessary, you know, that kind of way. And then in the off season scenario, I do find that maintaining a stable dose of either T3 and or T4, mainly that T4 dose, you'll find user for a longer period of time because you just want to get somebody out of that immediate hole. Like you just want to get them out of that immediate window, because if you look at it from a time-based perspective, the most amount of post-show stress that you're going to experience is going to be in post-show as simple as that sounds. So if you can use something that's relatively non-assertive, like T4, even a replacement dose of T3 will be considered non-assertive, you can get over that hump. And then when that person's you know, mentality, when that person's environment, when that person's finances, when that person's appreciation of themselves has improved, that's when you can start to kind of taper that out and look at it as a shift that you can make. Um, but again, it's athlete dependent. There's always going to be scenarios where you don't use it. I have a lady, for example, who's hypothyroid. She has that condition. 
she's a perfect example of somebody who would never ever need it um she has a i think it's called carbamazole um is a hypothyroid medication and even still she just pulls and pulls and pulls she's like six weeks out she's a master's competitor and she's shredded to her fucking teeth on like three and a half thousand calories a day it's just but it's bonkers um so it's like you just need to look at every individual athlete as they are um i'm also terrible for giving straight answers i just go off on tangents so my apologies um but <laughs> there's scenarios for either one but you need to be able to assess the necessity for it and the more you understand about the thyroid access the better decision making practice you're going to have around using it as simple as it sounds yeah i think that's fair there are going to be some scenarios where you keep it in all the way through as well, Ross. Team yeah, ball, for example, in, through not through an off season, like, through the off season, through the off season. Yeah, yeah, occasion, occasionally, yeah. Like, and largely just because if I so for example, when you get to the upper ends of the athlete spectrum, for example, like let's say you have somebody who's just gone pro, or you have somebody who's about to go pro, or they're trying to get their Olympia qualification, and they're doing shows within you know four or five, six month blocks of one another. I don't need to fucking spend that time having yeah. that thyroid axis all fucked up halfway through the gaining period. I don't need that. I don't want that. He doesn't need it. T4 is largely unimpactful. The thyroid axis, actually, of all the hormonal axes that we have, has the easiest time recouping itself. So you generally tend to see that managing itself better. So, like, if I wanted to pull it, I will. But, like, if I want to try and avoid any chance of issue, because I don't see any real issue in maintaining it, because really what you're relying on then is the body's efficiency in converting T4 to T3 for the most part. T4 has its own kind of actions on what we call periphery tissues. Um, for example, like dopaminergic responses, like that's one of the things in the theories around um, post-show and post-show blues, where when let's say you have either a natural competitor, for example, who's been pulled out of prep or has finished their prep and you know they have thyroidal declination, or you have an athlete who maybe has a lesser informed approach and they remove all lipolytics from the stack like thyroid hormone you immediately see a drop off in that dopaminergic action. So the capacity to feel reward, the capacity to feel kind of self-worth, so to speak, in what you're doing. So there's a real, real strong theory to suggest that the impacts of the thyroidal access probably have quite a significant impact on the idea of post-show blues. Um, and I've seen it happen before. Um, with athletes with friends with like, you know, close individuals in my life where they're, you know, the, they were the definition of post-show blues you know, and then the replacement of thyroid hormones after, you know, sufficient evidence in blood work, really, really, really seeing a significant impact for the positive on that individual. So, you know, it's, it's about understanding what are you willing to run the risk of and then understanding what are you actually risking by using T4 year round. And in my opinion, it's fuck all, you know, it, it's very, very little for the sake of having that safety blanket and maintaining a certain basis of hormonal output like maintaining a certain basis of metabolism. That in of itself doesn't even happen in natural functionality. So like, again, there's, there's ways of looking at it. Like you're trying to gain predictability as a bodybuilding coach. And if that gives me more predictability, I'm going to do it. Yeah. But we've done this year, isn't it, Callum? Get T4 in. Yeah. 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 Um, who's dinging, by the way? Not me. I'm not Dean. I sound a bit like Dean. <laughs> no, dinging, I said. Dinging. Uh, so what's up? And it's going. Actually, it, could, it, could, it could be. Oh, that, that's definitely me dinging. That is definitely me dinging. Uh, how do you turn the sound off? Go on to WhatsApp settings and put in no sound notification. Okay. Also, that's before nice. I forget, I watched a um, I watched a film last night on Amazon Prime called <laughs> Backdoor Slots Nine. <laughs> <laughs> it was called uh, <laughs> what was it fucking called <laughs> it was called oh, there we go. the ministry of ungentlemanly warfare Damn. You like it? no sounds good though pretty good it's, no. it's, by, it's by Guy Ritchie it's worth watching uh, anything by Guy Ritchie is always going to slap man every single time it's good every film. single time thanced on a true story is it, which is interesting is it similar to is it similar vibes, Cal, to what his other films are? Yeah, yeah. Yeah. I love all the camera work in Guy Ritchie movies and the commentary is the best thing ever. Did you ever see Snatch? Yeah. Top class, mate. Snatch, Snatch is one of my favorite movies of all time. The only thing that's bad about it as an Irish person is how terrible Brad Pitt's pikey accent is. <laughs> it's horrendous. It's horrendous. 
we were we were walking we were walking through where were we the other week in Manchester? We we're walking through somewhere to have dinner, and Ross is walking beside me, and this bloke walks past us, and Ross goes, "He was one hundred percent a pikey." <laughs> <laughs> he's got like a pikey radar <laughs> yeah I, I kind of got fished I got fished him out but looking over my shoulder over 27 years Con question what do you find the most challenging aspect of coaching I think for me this year, the most challenging aspect of coaching has been, um, for me, being a professional athlete, getting there has been a case of getting things done regardless of personal circumstances, regardless of financial circumstances, regardless of anything, right? They're, they're the people that tend to make it to the top, the people that find a way regardless, and I think this year for me, the most challenging is when people struggle to continue working towards their goals, despite exterior or external, should I say, external factors going on. That that challenges me as a coach because for me, it would just be a case of pushing on because that's what I've done in the past, regardless of circumstances. So that that's something that I've had to um, learn as a coach this year that maybe not everybody is of the same mentality um i would get a little bit short with people maybe i would have a little bit of a lack of um, patience with people but that's certainly something that i've developed over the last sort of six or seven months to that that understanding so that for me was the most challenging actually um i think like i said being at the level that i'm at i know what is required to get to that level so you know, people come to you and say, I want to do this and I want to do that. I want to be a pro bodybuilder. And, you know, their um, their actions don't, you know, follow that up all the time. So, yeah, that was the most, that's been the most challenging thing. But I think you adapt quickly to understand that not everybody is going to be of the same mentality or cut from the same cloth as you. Yeah. Um, I remember that as well. I've ran into challenges similar to that, right? Like, like you said, people present you with a goal and their actions don't tend to align. Yeah. The only way I could yeah. really justify it, I could like morally justify it to myself is that I think when people tell you they want to go pro, what they're really saying is they want to know how to be a pro. Um, and that they're two very, very different things um, because they just don't know that what they're asking is, can you help me develop the skill set that will allow me to become a pro? And nine times out of 10, that is actually what they're asking you. You do get anom anomalies like athletes that come through that just fucking smash it, you know, and they just they know what to do and it's ingrained in them. But I think always giving somebody the benefit of the doubt that they can learn the skills, so to speak. And you know, when they present you with you know their own hurdles, you know, which are really just because the difference here is like most athletes look at speed bumps as if they're roadblocks, and that's the biggest issue that people tend to run into. It's like, oh, this thing happened, and they're approaching it like a roadblock, they stop. When the reality is that you yeah. get to approach those things similar to a speed bump, you know, you, you might need to slow down, like you might need yeah. to proceed with caution, but you continue to go in the same direction, you know, and then eventually you find that the next roadblock is also a speed bump. Because eventually what ends up happening is you might be a legitimate roadblock, you know, and then when that happens, you're not actually prepared to be able to handle that in any case of the world and you fucking fly off the handle, you know. And I think just trying to almost like translate what people say to me at times has been, you know, my I guess my own learning curve in that respect. I think something we spoke about con as well was the ability to switch off you know when you get busier when you have clients that are you know potentially demanding more um your ability to be like present and be fully switched off you know in the evening in training all that kind of stuff but as you get busier your ability to do that does diminish definitely it's yeah it's hella. personally that's diminished massively for me over the last six or seven months like it's got yeah, I, I do. I do think you you have to spend a period of time. Um, you have to spend a period of time struggling or being aware that you're struggling to manage it to then be in a position where you can start to manage it better. Um, yeah. because like that's that's what I've found, especially over the last three or four years. Like I've 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 been at uh, you know both ends of the extreme, and I think from being from being at that um that other end of the spectrum of like being very overwhelmed 
you also learn a lot about like noticing things you need to be aware of to not go there again because you know it starts it starts to you know there, there are when, when things happen they'll happen very very quickly and you're not really aware of the speed that they're moving and when you start to accumulate whether it's you know um, clients that are demanding more from you or just more clients in general obviously for you it's like you're fucking just in a groove so you just it's like flow state just keep on doing what you're doing and you do that for six months and you're in a very different position than when you were six months ago but I think you just need to go like you said Connie, you need to go through that process to then be in a position where it's like is the right word hindsight it's like you have you have the ability to look at what's happened in the past and then go right my future decisions are going to have a better capacity to manage this longer term sure um but yeah it's made, it's made more difficult i think it's made more difficult when you're not necessarily in the in the place that you want to be either mm. because you know you don't feel like you can swish off you don't feel like you can take a day off because you owe it to yourself to keep working hard you owe it to your team to keep working hard you know and that's that's been challenging as well because i'm not in a position where well i'm not happy with the position that i'm in i always want to be doing better so that becomes a challenge in itself, wanting to switch off, taking a little bit of a step back to maybe take two steps forward. Sure. You can't just just keep relentlessly pushing forward because that energy battery just gets gets drained. Yeah. And then you're no good for nobody, right? Yeah, don't worry about it. I learned, I learned that the hard way, brother. So, you know, speaking to the congregation here, to the cows as well. Like, I think, <laughs> excuse me. I think the biggest thing there, though, is that the irony is regardless of the situation you're in, you're always going to have that little voice in your head of like, I can do more. I can, you know, I can achieve more. I can be better. I can get more results. I can work with more people. I can do this. I can do that. So whether, whether you're working with, a, whether, whether you're working with a hundred people, or you're working with 10 people, you, once you get to a hundred, your mindset's still going to be in the same boat. Like you're still going to be in a position where it's, well, I've got this far so I can do more. So I think the, the quicker you can, yeah, the quicker you can instill those habits and thought processes, the 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 longer and the better it's going to serve you. Because I wouldn't, I don't, I wouldn't wait for the oh, you know, once I'm at this point, I can I can start looking after myself. You got to you got to yeah. put those things in place now, so you can even get there and sustain it in the first place. Yeah, exactly. So that's proactive a- rather than reactive. Hundred percent. Exactly. I, I wish I was able to do that previously. I'm better at it now because I was, you know, kind of forced into doing it at one point in time. To, to, like, I just, you just don't have anything in you. Like, you just don't. Um, and like, you can go, you can work for a hundred percent of your time, but you'll only ever be able to give seventy percent of your efforts. You know, and it's like, how much of a more valuable can you be if you take 20 percent of your week off? You know, to give one hundred and fifty percent of your efforts to the job that you do, and that's the mentality that kind of I switched into I take a space I go down to my partner on the weekend and I'm like I'm go away you know for at least 24 hours like yeah. no <laughs> you know it's like it's no um do a little bit in the morning or whatever but it's like just putting the brakes on you know I think that's uh, I think that's something we probably all had to learn the hard way so to speak all of us sitting here you know and kind of you're in the process of learning it Cal you definitely learned it the hard way um, you know, Lou, I'm sure you're in the exact same situation, probably somewhat as me, where you're like, you just don't really know. I, I think my thing is, I don't really know what enough is. Yeah. You know, that kind of way, because I, because I think I have this um very high regard of what I quantify as the measure of enough. You know, and previously it would have been financial, like it would have been client numbers, it would have been all these kind of things, and you know, I think when you kind of get yourself wrapped into that headspace, which admittedly I have, you know, on more than one occasion, I think that you end up in a place where it's like you almost lose sight of what you're actually working towards, you know? Yeah, because it's quite scary at times, isn't it? Like, because you think, will, will anything ever be enough? Do you know what I mean? It's always this, that constant thought of, because I look back to where I was two or three years ago, and it's like, I would have done anything to be where I am now in terms of the clients I'm working with, the numbers I'm working with, you guys I'm working with, all that kind of stuff. But it's like, why do I still feel the same as what I did two, three, four years ago when yeah. I was working with half, a quarter amount of clients that I am now? It's true, man. Cal's just said that. Cal's, Cal, he's just said that, isn't it? Yeah, yeah. It gets to 100 clients and you're probably still going to feel the same. Yeah. It's, uh, it is scary, yeah. Yeah. That's, that, I think a lot of that's just... Um, it's a, lot, a lot of that's perspective and it's also getting to a point where you... Um, you got to like have clarity over what you find fulfilment what you find fulfillment from and that fulfillment 
can't be numerical to to that extent you've got to find fulfillment of of something else because regardless of where the numbers or the income or anything else comes from it there's like a byproduct of what you're doing your your mindset once you get a little bit it's never it's never going to be like you're always thinking oh once i've got this i'm going to be sweet and you know everything's everything's gucci from there you'll never get to that point because once you're there you're just going to go fucking hell i've got this point so why can't i have this and that and this you've you've got to you've got to you know, sooner rather than later, realize what's going to going to give you fulfillment, and out of that clarity, I think you get longevity with it. Um, and that's something that I've learned. I've learned definitely over the last couple of years, one hundred percent. I think I've noticed when I start focusing more on, uh, and you know, like you've just said, the numbers, uh, the income. I actually enjoy my job less. Yeah, I'm, yeah. I'm focusing on that too heavily. Yeah. You know, that really, that really takes the enjoyment out of the job. And so that's, that's something I've, I've learned pretty quick as well. The, 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 the irony is about, um, about 12 months ago, I, uh, I said to, obviously Zoe's in, Zoe's in kind of facilitating that role now where she handles the, the, all the reviews and the the day to day stuff on that side, but said to James Gibson, I said to Zoe, I deleted all of the bank account, Starling, etc., from my laptop, my computer, and I said I don't even want to know what the business is earning or what I'm earning. All I want to know is everything's sweet, and then I don't care because the more you think about it, the more you start to resent it because it just is you just start to fixate over things that don't necessarily have any value longer term they obviously have value but it's it's not the value that you're you think it is so 100 percent resonate with that and i think um i think yeah finding and it is fucking hard is what it takes time but finding that clarity over what is going to give you a fulfillment in the job and what you find you know your personal wins come from as long as you've got everything you need to and like living the lifestyle you want to live and being comfortable which is obviously the, the backbone of what we have once you've got that, you've got to be really selective about what actually, what what does this mean now, and what am I going to do with it? Yeah, that's that's even a conversation that I had with you recently. Um, so full disclosure, I had some just just some mental difficulty around my financial situation at per- different times over the last couple of months for you know certain reasons in my personal life that just got wrapped up and central towards my bank account. And it happens, you know, it, it does happen, and you know, I think that the gauge of what I deem to be my goal now is to you know, be able to like pay my rent every month, you know, go home, you know, if I want to go away for a couple of days, I can, you know, that's about as far as I deem like I want to think about it for now. Like when I want to go and travel for a show, I can do it, you know, the kind of way, not like I did it a couple of years yeah. ago. When I, was, when I was traveling to those shows a couple of years ago, I was doing it with money I didn't have, you know, just to try and build some notoriety. And I don't regret a single trip. Um, But kind of like my gauge for it now is my ability to do what I believe is my moral compass in my job but still be able to live my life on the back end of it. That's about as far as I think, you know, and have a Ford Ranger. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. But I, th- that, that, I think that thought process like ties into like what you were saying, Con, about like the whole thinking and mindset of like what you're, oh, I'm, I'm going to, the, the biggest thing for me is, and that turning point was like, I'm going to be happy when I get X. And you're in a position where it does never works like that. You're never in a position where that will ever be enough. Like fucking two years ago, you know, I fucking bought 150 grand G wagon, and I was like, <laughs> you know, I'm gonna buy this G wagon, and my fucking life is complete. And then two <laughs> months later, I'm like, I don't even fucking want it anymore. Yeah. <laughs> two months later, you're like, why the fuck did I buy that? <laughs> like it just, it just, your mind just completely changes. I'll, I'll never ever forget. Did you text me? <laughs> You're like, look, look what I got. And you sent me a white G wagon. <laughs> Private Reg as well. Is 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 you sent me a pair of Jordans that he bought? <laughs> it was a fucking G wagon. It, it's just it's really, but that's like they're like little things that I've probably shouldn't have done in the past that are very immature and irrational that probably could have been used in a much more efficient way and an effective way, but. You know, those are, and James Gibson, James Gibson always says it's your, it's your lessons, it's your fuck ups where you learn from. But the biggest thing there is just, you're never gonna, like you said there, Connor, in terms of like, I'm gonna, you know, I, I feel like I can't chill out or I can't take time for myself because I'm not here. 
it doesn't matter if in, in six months time, when you've got 30 more clients, you're still going to be thinking the exact same thing. You're going to be like, well, I need 40 now. I need 50. So you've, do, you've just got to put those things in place now. So this is sustainable in the long term anyway. Yeah, I've definitely learned that over the last six months. Any burnout includes actual illness. So yeah. March, I got shingles and I was completely burnt out. Yeah. Two weeks ago, I caught COVID. I had a chest infection. I was completely burnt out. So I need to start learning that pretty quickly. Yeah. I can't be ill every fucking three months because I'm fried, you know? Yeah, for sure. And like the, the even, even more so, like how fucking hard you boys train as well. Like, oh, yeah. You, you, it's it's you're demanding a lot from your physiology as it is and then you add a full-time coaching job onto that and all the stresses that come with it it's a lot to, it's a lot is the reason why i don't bodybuild anymore because it's just sending me under like i couldn't manage them both i couldn't do it um it's a it's a lot it's you a don't want to be you don't want to be deemed but you don't this is this is the life that we've worked for though you know when i set out when i first started sort of you know coaching when i made that transition over the, the point was that coaching is going to give me that more flexibility. It's going to give me that lifestyle to be able to facilitate becoming a professional bodybuilder. So, you know, it's, you don't want to be ringing people up, moaning about it, you know, saying it's really tough because I'm bodybuilding and coaching. I'm doing exactly what I said I wanted to do. Exactly. You know, so it's, it's difficult in your, in your mind because you're like, okay, I do need to take a step back. This is quite demanding. But then at the same time, this is what I wanted to do. So we keep fucking pushing forward. So yeah. it's it's a, it's a it's a balancing game. Yeah, and the, the, I had a I had a I was leaving the gym today, and um, this lad walked up to. I was basically trying to reverse the truck and basically like nearly crashing into every car that was in the car park. But this lad came up to me and was like, "Oh, nice truck!" He's like, "Oh, I'd I'd love to get one of those one day." And he goes. Um, he's just started working a labouring job at Birmingham Airport. So he's like, he's probably on, I don't know how much to get paid, but I can't imagine it's very much how hard they work. And he's like, I've just started, he's like, I'm skinny at the moment. Can't afford my gym membership. Just started working a, a labouring job at, at the airport. And there he goes to afford my son's, to my, it's my son's birthday next month so I can buy him a present. And then like, you hear little things like that and you're like, fuck me. I'm in a very privileged position right now. Absolutely. No, and then everything just suddenly goes, into perspective like that little things you know so sure. um that's life le that's the life lesson for this uh, podcast done <laughs> what are you going to say gone we we don't have them moments we, we don't have them moments enough yeah. where things happen i mean we don't want yeah. we we don't want bad things to happen to us of course not but i don't feel like we have them moments that put things in perspective enough you know, especially especially when we're in the position that we're in, yeah. And it's um, yeah. it's it's important to to step back, like you said, when we do have them moments, and appreciate what what you've got, what you've worked for, the position that you're in. But the truth be told, we forget we forget very quickly, though, don't we? Oh yeah, yeah. We we you know tomorrow you'll wake up maybe and you'll be moaning about something that's really trivial. Because we 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 we're fickle, aren't we? We fucking forget. It's easy to forget. Yeah. When it's easy to forget when you're in it. You know, mm. like it is easy to forget because yeah, you're dealing with your own head. You know, like you're not being faced with the reality of somebody else's life when you're dealing with your own shit. And I think that when yeah, you're, yeah. Pre you're presented a situation that is kind of far worse than your own, you know. And if you ever are in a situation, yeah. it's a life lesson and a bit hoodoo voodoo. But if you ever do find yourself, and no matter what the thing that's driving you to a point where you think like that is put yourself in a situation around people you are more privileged than, you know, and you'll very, very quickly find yourself probably realigning what you're, what you're, what you're actually trying to do again. You yeah. know, I walk, yeah. you know, I walk through Manchester City Centre three or four times a week, you know, and it's just like, just the homelessness everywhere, you know, like everywhere. And Dublin's the same where I'm from. It's a very difficult place to grow up. It's a very difficult place to live at times, you know, especially for somebody who's on the back foot, you know, and you, you, you kind of quickly realise just how, how lucky you are. Yeah. Most definitely. Most definitely. Um, uh, another one's come in. Here you go, Ross. Um, considerations for 
well, it's uh, open to everyone. Considerations for bodybuilder using insulin, both quick and long. How is it dosed? That's what your food is. Really, like the, I guess to first understand the basis of insulin use, you kind of need to understand what insulin is. Um, so I actually put a story of this about the other day. So essentially, essentially what insulin does, so insulin kind of unlocks the door for the body's ability to take in glucose. In this case, it's cells, right? They're taking glucose and they send it to wherever it needs to go. What insulin will do is essentially upregulate the capacity for you to do that. So you first of all need to understand that are you in a position whereby you are now warranted to utilize something like insulin? I.e., is your food high enough? Because really what you are doing as a heavy bodybuilder is driving yourself towards, I guess, kind of like, you know, uh, self-administered diabetes uh, in the sense that like you're getting to a point where your body weight is so high and your food is so high and your kind of physiological environment isn't actually set up to manage it. You know, you're just kind of like, you're, you're a diabetic if the needle was turned up to a hundred, you know, it's like you're, you're highly, highly, highly elevating your body's normal standard carbohydrate intake because the demands that you deem are set in your training or your coach deems are set in your training warrant that. So if your food is, you know, moderately high to high, you probably don't need both of them. Um, at least in my opinion, I think that when, when somebody needs both fast and long acting insulin, I think that's good. That's a very niche point in time. Um, or you are somebody who is, I guess, like pro proclivative to using insulin and likes insulin. That's when you might kind of warrant into that. Um, generally, your starting dose of something like Lanthus is going to be 10 to 15 units a day. Um, that's normally going to be your starting dose at a kind of moderate to high food basis. And then when you get to a point where like that, that kind of dose of Lanthus just doesn't really make sense or when you deem that the architecture of your meals across the day, so to speak, is very, very highly condensed into that peri-training window. And, you know, there's not really enough movement or contractive capacity that would ever be done to facilitate the transfer of those nutrients. That's when you might use something like, you know, fast acting insulin, like Humalog um, or Nova Rapid or something along those lines. And normally your starting dose there is about five IU um, pre and post generally, you know, that's normally kind of where you're going to be leaning to. But I would rarely, and this is just like, again, based off experience, not necessarily anything that's set in stone. I would be not necessarily looking to use that kind of dose of human of fast acting insulin until your Atlantis dose goes to about 30 units a day. Um, you know, then you might look at kind of spreading that and being a bit more specific around kind of your acute dosing of something that's going to drive nutrient transport. Um, because at moderate to high food levels, that basal use of Lanthus, which will act for the majority of the day, um, that's probably going to be enough to sustain the kind of thing that you're actually looking for it to do. Um, you can use really high doses of insulin if you understand the risks and you're warranted to kind of go into that space. But generally, starting those 50 to 20 units, ride that out till you get about 30 to 40. If your food is still at a pretty high base, right. you find yourself getting to that place where you deem it appropriate, then you might look at being, okay, I'm going to be specific around the training window now to avoid me getting to a point where I'm not utilizing that food appropriately. Yeah. I think that's fair. Um, anything else that you would... Any steps you would put in place before opting for the insulin card? Like if you were going to go right, Lantis first, rapid acting in key windows of time second, what would be before the Lantis? Some people might use metformin or berberine, um, something like that. The only problem I've ever found with metformin, despite it being effective, is with some people, they, they take 250, 500 milligrams of metformin and they're fine. Um, with others, it fucks their gut up like almost immediately. And like the longer that I see that happen, the more I'm like, just fucking get rid of it. You know, <laughs> you know, like I, I just don't see enough warrant if you're just really shitting your guts up every day because you're using metformin. Mm. Uh, I would taper the dose initially in the earlier stages. Um, and that might be kind of something that's, you know, a little bit more effective or dropped than something like berberine. Um, but unless I have used metformin as like a standard, I guess, like ancillary drug for like managing it's like, because uh, metformin has secondary health benefits beyond just being an insulin medic. And um, I believe it's renal protective as far as I know, like don't quote me on that one. Um, and then you also have like kind of globe for females. It's quite effective as well for managing um, your, your blood sugars, which can be influential in terms of managing your uh, fertility as well. So that's another one that could be those. That's some really good studies on females using metformin. Um, so, you can use metformin initially if you wanted to. Um, but if you're at a point where food is like 
mega high. Metformin is reactive, and I think insulin is proactive um, in most cases. So like metformin is like, okay, I'm going to, I'm seeing a little bit of an issue here. Let's use metformin just to kind of give us a bit of a kick up. And then when you're looking at kind of insulin, you're like, I'm about to put your food fucking high here, man. You know, this might be something that we need. But again, the person would probably present some kind of symptomology to warrant using insulin initially. Um, because you don't want to get to a point where somebody's food is so high, but it's not really doing anything. Mm. Uh, you know, and if someone's body composition is out of whack, you know, like there's, there's so much stuff that kind of goes into it. Again, the other thing that probably didn't mention is, are you just a fat fuck? You know, like, do you just need to pull some body fat off to improve your insulin sensitivity? You know, because if you use insulin and you're already a fat shit, you know, that's probably going to make the situation worse. So it's going to make you at least look worse and function worse. Yeah. Uh, so anyone who's used insulin before knows that if you use enough of it, it makes you sleepy as shit. You know, like you, you and you'll, you'll find, you'll, you'll see that, like, you'll drive the shift in your blood sugar quite a lot in those earlier stages and it can make you feel like you're going to fall asleep. If you're using growth hormone as well, people don't realize that growth hormone also has pretty significant actions on insulin partitioning and glucose partitioning. So if you're driving that on kind of multiple axes, you know, you're kind of, I don't want to say you're playing with fire, like as if like, because I don't actually believe insulin is all that dangerous. I think improper use of insulin is is pretty dangerous. Um, and, you know, use outside of the realms of necessity is probably pretty dangerous. But it's very, very valuable as it's not androgenic. You know, that's one of the things that people need to understand as well is it will drive a pretty significant return on investment without influencing your hormonal axes, which is, you know, from a health perspective, is probably one of the more valuable things about it. Yeah, I think the the some of the um, uh, off season management growth hormone, but particularly insulin use when you're in a big calorie surplus and you know you're at a point where you're just shoveling GI complaints, you're inflamed. But the longer you spend time there, it, that can be a real train wreck when it's mismanaged. If you spend too long there, for you know, especially at a higher body fat percentage. Um, you know, we've all seen that where it's just like people are just like super inflamed at the end of an off season phase where they've just probably pushed two or three months too long. Um, and yeah. the, because they're there, they're like, oh, you know, I've only got eight weeks left in off season. I might as well just push this for eight more weeks. But it creates a really, um, a really torrid time in terms of prep start points. So that's one thing to be mindful of there. If you're just thinking, oh, if 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 your only focus is blood glucose and you're you're carrying, um you know you're, you're you're seeing body composition get worse and worse and you're like more calories more insulin it's um we've all seen that as well like push your 300 pounds it's like oh, i've only got 15 more pounds to go so i'll put another 20 oil anson and 300 grams of carbs and it's like you just you, you've got to go off the visual side as well and if that's getting worse then you need to put the brakes on yeah like if you're like ballooned out in the face insulin probably isn't the answer mm. you know like it, it probably or like a legit fat bitch, like which which happens. Obviously, you see it all the time. Like you know, it's true, bro. Let's be real about. It. I'm not gonna name names, right? But like, so many people out there who are like 300 pounds or close to no, it's not. You're a fat fuck. Yeah, you know what I mean, and it's kind of, and you're gonna have yeah. to pull off 60, 70 pounds in a prep now. You know, that kind of way. It's like nobody needs. To, I've pulled 50 something pounds off in a prep before. It's fucking yeah, horrendous. Yeah. It's yeah. literally the worst thing in the world. It's the hardest thing in the world. It's horrible. Like, and it's it's not worth it. You know, that kind of way. I thought I was Johnny Big Balls at that point in time, you know, and I, I was probably handling my food pretty poorly. Um, you know, I, I got my prep cut from like 20 weeks to like 11, but that's that's a different story altogether. But like, if you're, if you truly are kind of like proceeding on the side of like most normal people will just think you're fat, then that's probably a problem, you know, and like that's probably the immediate kind of decision that will be made is to pull that back down. Because even still, if you're still at a pretty high body weight when you pull down, insulin is probably more valuable then than it was when you were fucking 280, 290. Yeah. You, know, you still have a pretty high basis of food and you probably can then utilize that at a more moderate dose to continue to facilitate more accurate nutrient partitioning without risking a higher basis of body fat gain. Because yeah. body fat gain is going to be influenced by poor insulin sensitivity. You know, yeah. but if you're already at your body fat is high enough, you're not really fixing that problem. You know, could I track back five steps to take 10 more and, you know, maybe have some abs and some remnants of condition? Yeah. Um, this one's actually for aimed at Connor and Lewis from the last YouTube video. Can you explain how you boys program your, um, well, I don't know if you do, I don't think you do an, he, he's under the assumption because it is an upper body session, you do an upper lower split, but he just basically said, can you talk through how the upper body session works within your week? So upper one's Thursday, legs Friday, upper two is Saturday. 
upper one. We change it this week, but I'll just go through what we're doing before because it makes more sense. So upper one was chest focus pressing, lat focus pulling, a bicep, tricep, and lateral. The upper two session was shoulder focus, so more laterals and a shoulder press. The back work was more kind of trap rumble focus, and then again, just top up bicep, tricep, and either rear or medial doubt. So both sessions, the, the push and the pull, which is obviously going to take more than obviously the bicep, tricep, lateral. Those are split. Um, so it just makes more sense, obviously, with only the one rest day in between. Um, and in terms of the rest of the week, we also have the push on the Monday. Then we have the posterior on the Tuesday. So between the Tuesday and the Thursday, it's two days. Uh, between the upper session on the Saturday and the Monday with push, again, it's two days. So, for example, that's why the Saturday session is more shoulder focused because the Monday session, the pressing there, again, is more chest focused work. So it just kind of fits together. So there's no overlaps really session by session. Yeah. Really nice way of giving you, giving your body, um, you know, enough time to recover between the sessions as well. I've found yeah. when, when split correctly, enjoyable, enjoyable sessions as well. The lower is, um, particularly the, the two upper sessions. No, no, no sort of just bit of bro science. It's just fun to train back and, and, like shoulders and chest all at once mm. you get so you get so into push pull low it's just it's just it's just a novelty at the moment to to train you know more than let, let's say one or two body parts together push and pull it's not i think when you look at this specifically as well our, our legs will respond by more than enough to train them once every seven days whereas upper body is going to respond better in terms of obviously we're looking at where i mean kind of how we respond to stimulus at different body parts we're going to be a lot more better served working at higher volumes with a upper body than a lower body as well, for sure. Yeah. Yeah. That's exactly. always been the case. And the, the, um, what have you found in terms of shifting for, um, like recovery relative to the, the, like, obviously you're more so on push pull leg oriented last time. Have you, have you found the initial shift from like full upper body sessions has been, you were battered at the start and now it's getting better or is it just been smooth the whole time? I think it's with really that a lot. Sorry, Karen. Karen, Karen. Depends what phase you're in, really. Obviously, Lewis is that, that's got a big, obviously, what phase you're in could have a big impact on that, isn't it? You know, see, so Lewis, Lewis at the moment, his recovery is definitely a lot slower than mine because of what phase is in. Um, but that initial shift, I actually found that my recovery was better. Um, I, I found that I rec could, I think could actually recover better from what we're doing beforehand. I think with the upper sessions as well, it's not necessarily going to be tissue recovery. It's more so going to be looking at your nervous system as well. Obviously, working at kind of less less workload per muscle group per session, you're not going to get that soreness really. So it's always going to be looking more so towards the nervous system fatigue that's going to build up throughout the week from the just generally larger kind of sessions as well. Nice. Okay. And the, the arm work, you're just... Um scattering in yeah so the triceps is triceps biceps both so tries we're looking at three times per week monday thursday saturday biceps we're looking at twice per week which is uh tuesday and a saturday as well so yeah i mean just scatter across i think you know in terms of when you're looking at higher frequency when you're looking at your bigger body parts your chest your back things like that your arms are going to be tagged on like towards the end of sessions and you can hit them very, very frequently. Cause I think the recovery there's, you know, pretty damn quick, especially like comparing it to the, your, your larger body parts for sure. Okay. And are you doing um, hinge patterns? Are you doing a hinge at the moment in, in lower or are you not doing hinge? So the hinge would be in the Tuesday session, which is the posterior, but with an issue I have at the moment, my hip Connor, again, similar issue. We've actually taken hinge out at the moment in terms of like a, a hinge with a bar, like an actual pull, but we're just using the glute drive now instead and actually spending just a little bit more time over a weight um, with some bent of rows instead of just the hinge and then more kind of chest supported work. We're looking to target the glutes more specifically and then target the erectors, you know, just overload basically. Nice. Which is working quite well. Nice, nice. Well, I'm, I must admit, every time I train, like if I either do an upper or a lower now, just because I just I just don't like if I'm training 
three, four times a week. It doesn't make it doesn't make any sense to do singular body part sessions for me if I can only get in a certain amount of time. So I'll just go in. I'll either do chest or back to start, and then I'll and then I'll I'll, I'll push or pull to start, and then I'll just do the reverse on the second half of the session, and just two two or three exercises for each. And um, it's surprising the amount of work you can get done in a very small exercise pool as well. I think as well, like yeah, when you're looking at um, quality as well, like you know for a fact when you're in those upper sessions, you have three sets of pressing, three sets of chest work. So none of those sets you can miss. You know, you have to be switched on for every single set there because you're only going to have two, three, maybe four opportunities within that session to actually get some quality work done as well. Mm. It's worth saying that, that that sort of split that we're on at the moment is probably only suited for a small um, maybe pool of athletes that have that type of mindset as well. I would necessarily, for that reason, be programming it maybe for somebody who's a little bit less trained, or you know, you know, not not the upper end of um, an amateur or pro, because like Lewis has just said, you've only got three sets on chest, you've got three sets on back, you know, you've got to hit it. Um, so yeah, that's something to consider as well. I don't I don't have any clients that are on a split like that at the moment for for that reason really. It's definitely, um, yeah, you definitely can't miss the mark when you're training that sort of split. Yeah. But I think it's also like once you once you have a, like once you're, you know, quote unquote, once you're advanced and your execution's on point and the effort that you can put into a set is very, very high, it's quite cool to be able to be in a position where you can almost just portion off those sessions like, right, I only need three sets on that body part to get what I need to do done. And then I can fit this on that session as well and this. Whereas when you're working with when you're working with clients that maybe you don't have the confidence or ability to do that, you almost need to have the have the safety net of more there just because you know, well, if I give him three sets, he's probably not going to get that much stimulus just from three sets. So we actually need eight or ten to do the job. Yeah. Yeah, um, when you're in that position as well, <clears throat> and you can add in little bits like rest pauses and drop sets, they are going to be super, super beneficial to your, to your, you know, to your training. You know, I've I've recently re-added in drop sets and and rest pauses just this week, and I can already feel difference in terms of you know how I feel through the week. Um, so if you can get yourself in that position, you're in a you're in a good place. And do, with do you, with you train. remember we spoke about last time with the um like the week setups where you kind of layer them layer them on 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 X amount a week instead of adding them in and just keeping them in. Are you are you doing it like that or how are you kind of managing when those extended sets come in? So so we did we did go through a period of like twelve to sixteen weeks, maybe twenty weeks where we actually did follow that. Um, but then I think. Lewis, hit, you obviously scaled back on everything, didn't you, mate? And, you know, you pulled off, um, you know, you pulled down on food and PEDs and things. And then I was obviously ill. So we went through a block where we scaled our volume right back. Um, I haven't really discussed what we're going to be doing yet over the next sort of six to, you know, six to 10 weeks. But I'm thinking for me at the moment with the phase that I'm in, um, I don't really want to be having a deload every five weeks um that's just that's just me so i think we scatter them in um and we just keep it we just keep them in sort of maybe two or three rest pauses in every every session at, at this point i don't really want to be i don't feel like i need to deload every five weeks in, i think in as well like, phase. Once, you, once you get to your level of experience kind of as well like there's absolutely nothing wrong with auto regulating it session by session you know session you come in and you're like i'm fucked today truly so then you can just scale back right back down to baseline maybe for three four days and then all of a sudden you know you're fresh again and you know you can okay okay i'm fresh this week let's add in a rest pause let's add in a drop set and just auto regulate like that i think it just makes complete sense with where you know you're currently at yeah yeah auto regulation and it comes with the the you know experience and awareness there once you have that then it's it's a really really valuable tool that's not easy though that that's not easy again you know the it's all right it's all well and good having the awareness to to know that you're, you're fucked and you're in a hole it's another thing to take that step back and have a deload like i'm poor at that i'll admit that i'm not very good 
I almost need someone to tell me stop. You know, it's not it's not it's not that easy to do. Yeah, but that's, I think for that's someone like myself having that. You you need that. That's why you need that soundboard there. It's like you either you you messaging me yeah. or or you messaging you know you Lewis and saying oh. I feel like I feel like I'm a little bit fucked today, or you know, your sleep's off, whatever it might be, or your appetite's off. And then it's just a little bit of confirmation from somebody else that's viewing it objectively, where it's like, we should probably deload today. And then it's like, right, we'll deload. Instead of you yeah. bottling it up and not communicating, and then you're like, I'm just gonna get the job done. No, we we, we do, we do for sure. But in the past, it's always been, <laughs> Do you feeling fucked this week? Yeah, I am as well. Oh, let's do another week. <laughs> you know? <laughs> yeah. Definitely. Definitely. Um, anything you'd add to that, or it's pretty conclusive? Pretty conclusive, I think, mate. Yeah. Um, uh, what type of show do you have? Will an individual who Will an individual who is upper back trap dominant need less rear delt volume? Possibly, I think. With will an individual who is upper back trap dominant need less rear delt volume? It would have made sense to me. Yeah. If your if your traps and your your rhomboids are dominant, then you need you would it would say that you'd need more rear delt. Yeah. Yeah. You just you just you probably just have big rear delts to be honest with you. Yeah. Like, if you're if you're like pronated rows and you're strong, you're you're probably gonna have decent rear delts. I would say. If only shrugged for a year, then that might be your problem. But like if you've been doing any kind of row, um, you're gonna be taking an awful lot of brunt of that rear delt. Um, I think the idea of a rear delt fly makes it seem as though rear delts are exclusively trained in a rear delt fly. Um, any movement that is going to bring your arm in this direction in pretty much every plane of the yeah. you get there is going to be pretty driven through that rear delt. You know, like your upper back, your traps, the only real time they're actually doing anything is in that retraction. You know, it's the, it's the only real time they're actually doing anything. The rest of that is facilitated almost entirely by your rear delts and kind of other tissues in the shoulder girdle. So... <sighs> No, I suppose, I suppose is the answer because he probably a pretty big red else anyway. Yeah, I think you, he might be saying um, maybe the um, the movement patterns that he's doing for rear delts are going towards like he's like overcompensating through like the retractors, the scapula taking more of the load in those movements maybe. And then the rear delts are lagging directly because of the fact like traps or mid back are taking more of those movement patterns. But like you said, like, or like Lewis said as well, if you're in a position where you're strong at those movements that are going to engage it and your upper back's big, then the chances are your rear delts are also going to be pretty impressive as well. In that case, the answer is to do more direct rear delt work in the form of something like a flat, rear delt flat, you know, or some kind of like variation of a face pull, you know, something along those lines. Um, you know, tagging them on relatively high frequency comparatively to the kind of work that you're doing through protraction and retraction. And, you know, that's probably going to be your best bet. Yeah. Um, let me see if there's any more now. Ross, did also did you? I think you're on. You're. This is before the call. Um, you see somebody died in the CrossFit Games. Oh, what? In the first event. Damn. In the um, in the swim. <laughs> Colombian CrossFit athlete. Fucking Jesus. That's heavy. That's mad. Mad. It sounds obvious, but obviously they drowned, did they? Yeah, I don't know if it was I don't know if he had like a stroke or something when he was um when he was swimming, maybe. Fucking I don't know if, I don't know if you've ever watched any of those films that they've got on uh, Netflix about CrossFit games, but mate, some of the stuff they do is fucking insane. Yeah, it's not. Insane. Chris, Chris, 
Rich Fromm, is that his name? Rich Ronan, yeah. Rich Fromm, that guy. I'd like, that guy's an animal, bro. And um, the, the lad that won it like four years, four or five years in a row, uh, Matt Fraser, it's like the engine they've got is ridiculous. And it like it's so funny because you know when we uh like if I said to if I said to Con, I was like, right, Con, I want you to I want you to wake up tomorrow and I want you to do a five thousand meter row. I want you to go on a four mile run. Then I want you to do a hundred pull ups, a hundred burpees, and a hundred sit ups. And then two hours later, mate, I need you to do a full leg session. <laughs> and then I need you to swim at six p.m. and then go on another run before you go to bed. That's that's literally like the training schedule for those boys that are on the elite level is is obscene. But like they're they're conditioned to the point where it's just clockwork. They can recover from pretty much anything they do. Obscene. EPO helps. EPO Say again. helps a lot. EPO helps. <laughs> the doping probably helps as well. But yeah, yeah. Um, at that level, at that level, you fucking need to. Like you literally couldn't do it if you didn't. Like your body. I, I don't know whether they'd be. I don't know whether they'd be using peptides or not. I presume everything's banned. Yeah, yeah listen, on paper, so in paper it is in bodybuilding as well. Yeah. If you, if you, if you actually, actually, if you actually read the rules, like you're not supposed to take it. <laughs> you know, I would say it's quite a similar setup, or like you know, random doping tests, that kind of thing. Now, if they are not, and like you've got the, like that's just fucking phenomenal. You know, and I wouldn't. Uh, I wouldn't sit there and go, it's because of the gear. I'm not that kind of guy. Yeah. Um, it's I, I, I think um I think I reckon the doping testing is pretty rigorous though. Cause like if you know if you're on if you're on uh, if you're a team GB athlete um and you're on the athlete list for WADA or whatever the agent, whatever the governing board is, that you have to let them know where you are at any given time year round and particularly in competition so like if you've gone if you're like living in your house or you've like gone to a hotel somewhere if you've gone on a holiday they have to know where you are at any given time and they can turn up at your door at any moment to drug test you so like you could be it could be like 1 a.m and you're at home and they'll just fucking knock on your door and be like yeah i need you to piss test it's crazy um like the, the gym that i first started working at there's a guy called charlie large who used to coach a lot of um like olympic weightlifters and some of them were on like uh, the youth program for Team GB. There was one called Zoe, Zoe Pablo Smith. I think she was like elite level Olympic weightlifter. But she was, um, she was Great Britain weightlifting. And I remember, remember her saying, and she, she wasn't, she was probably like in her very early twenties. But I remember her saying on that when, when um, we used to work there, I remember her saying like it, the drug testing is like just completely out of nowhere, random, and you can't predict anything that happens. So it would be pretty hard to dope if you were in that circumstance. And you'd just be fucking constantly paranoid of getting caught as well because you wouldn't know the schedule of them testing you. True as well. I still try and do it. The documentary on... Uh, I mean, there was a documentary on Netflix. Of, uh, or of CrossFit? A documentary on Netflix. The American, it was an American, American facility where athletes would go to, to for them to design um, cycles and, and ways around the, the testing. You know, like Lance Armstrong had been there, that a lot of the, the pro um, athletes had been there, you know, the gymnasts and places like that. And they were, it's crazy. Seen it. The lengths that they go to to get away. Have you seen Icarus? Yeah, I've yeah, Icarus. Icarus. Yeah. Yeah. That shit is fucking fire, bro. That is so fucking good. Like your man got it's it's crazy. Like he starts off just being like, I'm gonna use dope and see how far I can cycle. And then suddenly he's breaking open like the fucking Olympic capacity to manage dope scandals, which obviously is very like anti-Russia in the actual thing. But you can pretty much be highly suggested that's probably how they're all doing it. But the um, doctor the doctor fled the country, he was getting trapped, wasn't he? He's still he's apparently he's still no one no one knows where he is, he's still gone. He's in America. He's most, apparently lives in America somewhere. Yeah, and he's doping all them guys over there to keep quiet. Then you know. <laughs> but, I, but I think when when um when all because uh, somebody was on somebody was on that uh, JRE podcast talking about it. I think when everything went public, like he was getting like knocks on his door and tracked, and he had to flee the country and go into hiding because I presume they're going to fucking kill him. Yeah, so, so you know, getting rid of Russia's little secret, even though it's not a secret. Yeah. Like, I, I, I honestly think the reality is that like in any sport within the Olympics where it's warranted, I would say at least half of the athletes are using gear. You know, because like you look at it from like what's that? Have you ever heard that gold medal study? Um, 
I think I, I again I'm I could be sub and misquoting, but the general premise is the same, where they had a pretty significant number of Olympic athletes where they were told you will win an Olympic gold medal, but you will die at 45 if you still do it. And like yeah. 70, 80 percent, 70, 80 percent of them said yeah. Mm. You know, and if you have the let's say for the USA Olympic team, you've got like the most the most advanced nutritional scientists, you've got the most advanced, you know, people in the field who are looking at you, and if it is an open thing, saying, we can do this, and you can get away with it, and you are more likely to win because everyone is doing it. 100% percent are saying yeah. Yeah. Look at the, I think it's like the fastest, maybe 20, 30, like 100 meter times. Every single one of them was caught doping, apart from Usain Bolt. Yeah. Is that true? It's crazy. Like, Yeah, it's like the 20, 20 or 30 like fastest times ever in 100 meters. Every single one of them was caught for doping, apart from Bolt. Wow. Yeah. Like, I just think you need to look at the Olympic weightlifting. You get these like sixteen-year-old Chinese girls fucking clean, <laughs> clean, clean. Oh, that is like, wild. Oh, yeah. Kilos. Like, I get it. The technique is, and, and they're like they're militant over there with the training that they do. But like, I just, I don't know. I could be. It could be just the fact that I'm involved in a sport that just openly discusses it, and you can we can see the material yeah. action these things can do to people beyond the scope of natural capacity yeah so i just think when you see super athletes like that and then you see that nobody else on earth seems to be able to do it like that i just think it kind of starts to waver on that side i'd say it's more popular in some sports like i wouldn't say the fucking ping pong guys are fucking slamming the gram you know like, <laughs> that's, that's not what i'm betting on when you have these guys who are like literally olympic weightlifters yeah you know where they compete in federations that i'm pretty sure are kind of like known to be like you know it's cool. It's not. Don't get caught, kind of thing. You know, I'd be, I'd be highly surprised to find out that every Olympic athlete is actually not doping, and that the major. I'd be, I'd be actually, I'd be just as surprised to find out if the majority aren't. Yeah. I had to do a piss test before. That was crazy. For I what? didn't. When I was training, when I was training in martial arts, I went to the Europeans in Geneva, and me and this other jacked up fucking Russian dude got sent into a room. I wasn't even really big at the time at all. I just like I think I was just randomly tested. And they look at they they like they're looking at your whole dick pissing into this cup. Like and you just sit there and you just sit there and your whole dick. Your whole dick. The whole thing. Just just let me just let me get just let me read it out for you guys. <laughs> yeah. But like you don't get any ounce of privacy. Your man's just like sitting there, arms folded, you know, he's like we're men, we're both men. Yeah. You're gonna, yeah. gonna be this cup and I'm gonna test it, and that's it. You know, that, that was when um, I won the British in 2021. I literally yeah. had to go straight to drug testing. I didn't even get to go and see anyone, nothing. That's crazy. Yeah. Mental. Same with the footballers as well. Same with the footballers. They can have somebody knock on their door and they are literally not allowed to leave until they have a piss. Mm. doesn't matter where you go in. You are not allowed to leave the house until you have a piss, and they, and like Ross said, they watch you. They they literally watch you have a piss. I get stage five could be there for two. Hours. It's crazy. It's crazy. I get stage five pissing in the airport. Never mind pissing when you look. Yeah, <laughs> I'd be I'd be in uh, serious trouble. You, you'd have you'd have to monitor it, otherwise you people you just get people to swap in piss and like having samples that were pre made that were from other people. <sighs> oh yeah, there it is. Was that, was that Rohan? He was, was the, uh, he's, he's barking because he can't get the food that he left there last night. You know, oh. <laughs> there's like tons of food on the floor that he can't get, at, and he's a little bitch. No, he's got it now. Pretty sure, I'm pretty sure. Pre the Olympics, there was a story where um, a whole team—I can't remember what it was—it was athletes or gymnasts. I think it was China. Um, they all got tested by WADA. I think that's one of the one of the federations, yeah. and the whole team come back that they'd been taking um, a certain drug to enhance their performance, but they managed to get out of it by saying that it'd come through the air conditioning unit in the hotel. Yeah. But there's just two, there's two swimmers on the Olympic team who got um, like top three places where water were like, yo, they had a thing. And then as far as I know that the other way that they get around it is that the, whatever the Olympic committee is for that country, they then do an independent investigation. Right. The reality is that if these guys at this level are doping, the Olympic Committee in that country probably know about it. Mm. You know, they're probably fully aware. You know, they're kind of way like I've seen 
Like, yeah, like at the Olympic level, you see it, but like, I, I don't know if anyone's aware. Of it. Again, Lewis, you might, you might be aware of it. I'm just assuming that you're injured, that, you know, that kind of thing. But like, schoolboy rugby in Dublin, in South yeah. Africa as well. Yeah, schoolboy school, school rugby is huge in Dublin, um, with a particular side of Dublin. And there was a story years ago that one of the rugby coaches in a secondary school, these are the kids who are 16 and 17, were supplying them a growth hormone. Yeah, it's the same, it's the same in South Africa. I went on tour there when I was in the 16s and the size of some of these boys, and it's well known as well, like South African school for rugby is absolutely huge. And the amount of boys there on, on full cycles, literally at 16, 17 years old, is just, it's crazy, man. It's facilitated by them until they get the school boy and then they're pulled off, you know? And because they're not getting tested at school boy level. Yeah. You know, so this, this is why it kind of feels though at that level, you know, it probably does happen in the sports that's warranted. Like I said, like it's not, it's like the it's gonna it's not gonna be like fucking. But at the same time, like would for example, with something like modafinil, would that be doping for the guys who are doing the shooting? Mm. You know what I mean? Like, is that is that is that doping? You know, you, let a, um, if you have a if you have a Lemsit Max on competition day, you will be banned and fail your test. For what? We got. I'm not sure exactly what it is, uh, but we got told that when I was at because you went to you went to Hartbury Cow, didn't you? Yeah. Yeah, you went to uni, I went to college. Did and you when, go to Harvard College? Then, I never knew that. Yeah, 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 I did, yeah. Hey, I, I, I was fucking traumatised for about three years from South African rugby players that are about nine times the size of me. It's nuts, isn't it? I, I remember nuts. my first year, I, I, I was like fucking cricket captain, rugby captain at school, went to Hartbury, was a fresher, played freshers and thirds, and then I played seconds in my second year, never got to the first team. But I remember the first training session on the 4G pitch at the back at the back of the um at the back of the sports center. My first training session, because the seconds and the first used to train together. And um I'd like I've been train I've been training in the gym and like you do some S and C stuff, but I'm not I'm I'm pretty small in the grand scheme as a as a number five. And uh I remember that first training session I got absolutely fucking destroyed, mate. Because these blokes are, they're pretty much the same age as you, maybe a year's difference. They got fucking full beards down to the waist. They've got voices deeper than Ross's, and they're all massive, mate. And like, and they can move. And they're all rapid, and they're all athletic. They all they they've probably got shit diets. They don't they fucking go out every single night. They're boozing multiple times a week, and they're like super athletes. So you tell me that guy has not been doing gear since he was fucking fourteen years old. Trust me. I had um I had Genge there when I was there. Yeah. Hey, that he's a fucking head case. He is. He's absolutely nuts. Obviously, he's calmed down a bit now, but back in the day, there's actually a video on YouTube where Harpy played a South African rugby team. I think it was under 18s. And the scrap, mate, it should see Genge. He literally takes out probably three or four of them. It's absolutely mental. And you you're running around with these boys like weekly, like obviously we do we, you don't know if you used to call it smash. Like when you had training and contacting and training, it's called it smash. And um, every time you used to hear that, obviously being a back, being slightly smaller, they didn't care who you were, who you were up against. Like I'd be tackling these boys that are in last year, second row, first row, back row. And it's like, I'm like 16, 17 years old, just fresh out of like a, a private school where it was like, it was decent level, but it wasn't, it wasn't rough or anything like that. Mm. And it's like, holy shit, man. These boys are like all from around the world. They're massive. They can move. It's nuts. Yeah, it is impressive. It is impressive. Um, you can get into condition though and be full as fuck. <laughs> Do that, Mister Cooking Gange. <laughs> <laughs> he's, he's only cats in England. I'm sure. I'm sure he loved that. Yeah, that's, no, no, fuck him. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's mad. Absolutely mad. And, that, um, and that's why you've had five operations on two shoulders, Lewis. Yeah, because you were doing that at seventy. Exactly why? <laughs> Have you actually? I've had yeah, I've had surgery on this one, and I need surgery on that one. Damn. <laughs> That's crazy. But they are absolute animals. Do you guys know who Andrew Porter is? Yeah, he's from Ireland. He play, He trains in Southside. Right, that guy is like Mongo strong, like yeah. unbelievably strong. It, you know, it doesn't break a sweat. It like, doesn't break a sweat. And also one of the most pleasant guys you'll ever meet in your entire life. He's a fucking cool guy. Um, he's sound, proper, proper sound guy. And then, like I said, just a super athlete, just takes people out there a couple of times, a couple of times a week as well. I'm not a rugby fan in any sense of the word, but I'm, I, I love Andrew Porter. <laughs> he's a good guy. That is, um, that's one of the really interesting things about 
um, like relative strength in general. A lot of those boys, like if if you might be able to hear Coos parking, if you put them in a lineup and you got them to like get their kit off, you'd, you'd be like, no way is that guy benching fucking 100, 180 kilos, or no guy, no way is that guy fucking ripping that off the floor like that. But the athleticism and the relative strength of the of a lot of those guys is obscene relative to the amount of muscle mass they have. It's like power generation mm. in combination fucking massive. You know, like they're not like squatting like we squat. They're just like get this bar down and get it back again. And I know I remember the first gym I ever trained in. Like I'm looking the same age as Andy Poor. Uh, he was uh, he was there and huge. Still, he was even huge back then. You know, drinking a liter of creatine. <laughs> I'll never forget. It. <laughs> and even still, man, he goes into the gym, barely warms up, and he's just hammering. Like, he's just squatting like six, seven plates like it's nothing. Like, yeah. like, it's, like literally, it's nothing. ripping three hundred plus off the floor, no problem. Like literally, no problem at all. Um, you know, and, and he'll walk in, he won't like he'll walk in and he'll just like pick up a bar, you know, yeah. he's not, he's not conscious of what's out what the bar, he's just in there and he's just lifting. It's crazy. Yeah, it's fucking impressive. I think no. I'm always I'm always impressed by the guys, you know, the, the guys that use the uh, the rings in the gymnasts. Mm. Um, and the, you know, the, the, like, what the fuck? Have you, have you ever tried the strength? Have you ever tried on the No. That's so good hard. reason. So hard, even to do a press up target on the rings. Yeah, that sort of strength is just uncanny. Can you remember the um the essence the used to work in the well used to work at the gym S and C coach? Uh, he was also a lecturer, lecturer, I think, at the college. I think he was called Drew Boldhead. He was Jack. Yeah. Really. And he used to he used to train in the closed off downstairs gym where like the first team in Gloucester would train before they built the new um. The, the new uh, center i think it was called drew but he's, he used to drink like he used to have like a, a liter jug of whole milk um yeah. like drinking his sessions like around meals like he, he was a he was a freak mate but like i remember watching him train and he would only do like bench pull press squat patterns hinge patterns like snatches like he's like a proper a proper athlete but like the technical ability of his lifting it was like beautiful to watch because it was just everything was just so clinical but like his build he was fucking jacked like massive legs massive arms and all he'd do is just like pull-ups presses dips but he's just obscenely strong at everything um that that i think that was probably the first person i saw and he wasn't a body he, he obviously like trained a little bit of arms on the side but he wasn't a bodybuilder per se but it's the first person i saw that was like elite level development but like that was a legitimate you know he trained with a lot of thought process and, and he knew what you knew what he was doing when when you're a kid and you're like fucking 16 15 16 years old you're just slanging things around but then i remember when i saw that i was like yeah that's that's fucking cool to see i um do you know how else i was at hybrid with car that you know go on Corey. oh really Sleep. yeah yeah he was a year above me oh i never knew Corey's yeah. hybrid as well yeah, yeah, yeah. He was a year above me. He was, he was, he was fucking big. He was a big boy at, at college as well. Mm. Yeah, that's mad. That's mad. Um, I think that's it. I'd agree. Sweet. That's it. I'm going to include timestamps on this one as well. So we've got a, uh, somebody asked the other day for timestamps. So I'm going to include that in the, in the video. I don't know how to do it, but I'll figure out. Um, anything else in addition to that? Any news, any announcements? Everything's good. All good. Going back on cycle. Are you? Yeah. <laughs> don't have to keep taking the plates off for him anymore. Oh, uh, fuck off. <laughs> <laughs> what what have you started with? Highs and low, 200, uh, 200 test, 100 mass, 100 primo. Okay. And then what I, will, what I will look to do is my food's low ish compared to where it has been as well. So I'll just reverse my food, reverse my, my PDs over like a six, seven, eight month period um, and just see how it goes, basically. Nice. Exciting. Progress to come. Yeah, man progress to come um right thanks for that boys it's a pleasure